The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. Did y'all see the title this morning? Church must fear. Church must fear. We're reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And if church must fear doesn't make sense to you, I know the Scripture will. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Church atmosphere is the atmosphere of the church. That's what church atmosphere is. It's the atmosphere of the church. It is important that we set and allow the Holy Spirit to set the proper atmosphere. So I'm glad to tell you today that it feels good to be able to talk to you about something that you're already doing. You know, I just hate to talk to people about something that they're not doing because it makes you feel like you're kind of interrogation. We don't like to be, none of us like to be really interrogated a lot. So I don't really like to talk to people a lot about what they're not doing. Because if you talk to folks about what they're not doing, you either have to manipulate them to do what you want them to do or try to sell them on a bill of goods to make them feel like that they're not doing enough or whatever. But I'm glad today to be preaching to the choir and will encourage us to continue keeping on, keeping on and doing what we're doing for the glory of God, having the right atmosphere or church atmosphere. Now, so you talk about this church atmosphere or church atmosphere. What type of church atmosphere are we talking about? Well, the Scripture says that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. In other words, there was a proclamation of the Word of God. When the Word of God is proclaimed, God is glorified, Jesus is honored, the Holy Ghost is allowed to have liberty, and great and mighty things will happen when the Word of God is proclaimed. You know, in the beginning, you didn't have to worry about Baptist, Methodist, Church of God, Pentecostal, whatever, whatever, because everybody was, everybody was Pentecostal. Do you believe that? They really were. On the day of Pentecost, the church was born, everybody was Pentecostal. I mean, from that birth right there, the church was born, the gospel began to be proclaimed, and they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Now, you got churches today that call themselves apostolic, and they may or may not be in, in the apostles' doctrine. But it's not a name. It's a way of life. It's a behavior. It's the way that you live. It's the Word of God being proclaimed. When God's Word is proclaimed, God will honor that Word and great and mighty things will happen. You want to know how to have a church, how to grow a church? You don't have to go to Dallas, Texas or Houston. You don't have to go to uh, Minnesota or somewhere to have a conference to know how to grow a church. If you want to grow a church, do what Jesus said in the beginning. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world and you're going to grow a church because the Word of God will be proclaimed. People's lives will be touched and they will be uh, saved and they will be changed. Excitement will happen when the Word of God is proclaimed. Now you can have excitement without the Word of God, but it's not the right kind of excitement. When the Word of God is proclaimed, they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. There's a partnership in the family of God. And I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. The song said, They continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now when we have fellowship together, we're partnership together, we're partners in this thing. See, I don't want to hurt you. Because if I'm hurting you, I'm hurting me. If you're hurting me, you're hurting you. And we're in the same boat. So if you start rocking the boat, you're going to drown us both. So the best thing we can do is just be quiet and be groovy and just row together. Not be rocking the boat. Not be turning the boat over. We're all in this thing together. 
See, I can't bail out on you and you can't bail out on me because we do, we, we'll have a one-sided boat and you go round and round in a circle because one man can't row it. you got to have... <laughs> we 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 all got to be together. That doesn't mean that we, we cross every I together and we dot every I and cross every T and, and we agree on everything, but, it, but we agree on the main thing. We're together in the partnership. We're together in Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you're together in Christ, nothing else matters. Everything is going to fall in place where it needs to be because we're in the right partnership. Amen. The Apostles' Doctrine. Now you might get the idea there that that's just a kind of a lecture or a teaching, but it involves... Not only teaching, it's teaching and preaching and the whole thing of the Word of God. Jesus said, go to all the world, preach the gospel, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. They did, and they taught them. They taught them. Not just to have a class. And there's, there's nothing wrong with having classes to teach church doctrine and to teach the Bible. Certainly, we need to have to teach the Bible. But they taught them not only in a setting of lecture or class, they taught them by public example and living. And that's what the church needs today. Not just a class, but we need to teach the world by how we live outside of the walls of the church. In other words, you've got to take Jesus home with you. Can't leave him in the pew. Can't leave him in the songbook. You can't leave him in the pulpit. You got to have him in the pulpit first, praise the Lord. But you got to take him out there to the world. You got to take him where you live. Show by example of how you live. Amen. That's what's going to get the job done. It did it in the first century. It did it in the early church. It provided the right church atmosphere, proclamation, partnership, participation. Lord, help me say that word. (laughs) Participation. Not precipitation, what you when it rains and snows and all that. We're talking about breaking of bread. We're participating together. We are partakers together of His divine nature. Do you know that when you are a believer, and all of us are, I hope and trust that we are, and not you can be in the next five seconds. I mean, in one second, as far as that goes. But we are partakers of His divine nature. It's more than just saying, yeah, I I did a prayer, I signed a card, I shook the preacher's hand. When you said yes to Jesus, you became a partaker of the divine nature of God. You took on something you never had before, and that is called divinity. Now, that doesn't mean that we're divine, but we are partakers of His divine nature. Glory to God. And so they participated together. They were partaking together in breaking the bread. And that means, it's a double reference, it means communion, of course. Communion was a big thing in the early church. Because they were fresh on the heels of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they knew what communion was really all about. It hadn't become a ritual like it has in many cases today where we just go through a ceremony. They didn't have ceremony. They had the power of the resurrected Christ. They had the power of God. And they broke their bread together. And they didn't just do it in the temple. They had communion in the houses. And a lot of the temple then wasn't just a temple there. They had a temple. But a lot of church they had then was in the houses. See, we think you can't have church unless you go to a building. You can have church in a pup tent. You can have church in your house. You can have church in your neighbor's house. You can have church anywhere where believers are gathered together in the Lord. And you can have church when Jesus comes in your midst. That's church right there. You can have a church atmosphere right there where you are. An atmosphere. And they broke their bread together. It also means just breaking bread like we're going to go downstairs and break some fish and bread. Don't y'all leave here without eating. I'm telling you, you're going to miss a blessing. Fill your bread basket up. Brother Curtis said, Amen. (laughs) Fill your bread basket up. We're here to fellowship together and to break our bread together. They, what type of atmosphere or church atmosphere are we talking about? Proclamation, partnership, participation. And of course, we can't leave out prayer. Breaking of bread and prayers. Prayer is what got the church 
if you want to say it that way, to where it is right now today. And prayer is a big part. Thank God that I can say this. Prayer is a big part of our South Henderson family. And prayer is a big part of many the churches represented here too. I know Westwood Church and other churches represented. Prayer. We believe in prayer. We believe in praying for the sick. I mean, you know, I know we can get too way out with some stuff, but pray about everything. I mean, you know, if there's a knot on a log that don't look right, pray about that. If the puppy dog has cross eyes, pray, pray about that. Pray about everything. You know, pray. Pray in season and out season because prayer is what moves the hand of God. Prayer is what changes things in this world. And we can pray. We can pray down the power of God and we can pray up evil out of this world. We can pray. Prayer makes a difference. And they continued in prayer. Prayer will bring the right church atmosphere. Prayer will change the atmosphere. If you find that you trying to have a meeting or you're trying to have a service or whatever it is and it just feels kind of, you know how it feels sometimes. It just feels a little bit stagnant or it feels... And we must realize, brothers and sisters, that we're Pentecostal believers. A lot of times what is happening, there's nothing wrong with the preacher, there's nothing wrong with the choir. It, it, what's happening is the evil opposition of the devil that we have to realize part of the supernatural deals with the demon spirits. And we're, we're fighting against demon spirits. Amen. We're not fighting against each other. We're certainly not against each other. We're building each other up and we're lifting each other up. But then the snake from the Garden of Eden tries to come slivering into the church and tries to make problems into the church. And we have to pray that old booger out. We have to pray the devil out. And just pray. And make him hear our prayers. If you're going to stay around here slewfoot, you're going to hear some Holy Ghost praying. You're going to hear some prayers. And he can't tarry long. Put him in his place. He can't tarry long when saints begin to pray. Why this type of church must fear? Well, it's necessary for reverence. The Bible says here that fear came upon every soul. It's talking about fear not being woo afraid or scared. It's talking about godly fear. It's talking about reverence. When he said reverence my sanctuaries, when he said reverence my word, we are, and I'm talking to this age group, but we are responsible for teaching the younger folks how to reverence God. Now, I know that sometimes God can get a hold of anybody and He can use a younger man to teach me and I'm not unteachable. But when a younger man stands up and says to me, who has been in the ministry for all these years and I, that doesn't make me anything, but when he stands up and says to me, look, we don't have to preach against sin anymore. Just tell people that Jesus loves them. Well, that sounds good, but the Bible says you've got to preach against sin. The Bible says you've got to preach holiness. The Bible says you've got to preach righteousness. And we've got to keep on standing. If we throw in the towel now and stop preaching against sin, we're saying it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you do. As long as you know that Jesus loves you and you can just throw away the apostles' teaching, throw away the doctrine and, and do away with the ancient landmarks that your fathers have set. The Bible said don't move those landmarks. Who gave us the authority to move the ancient landmarks that the Holy Ghost has put out and the work of the apostles and the people who have founded the church who have laid down their lives and who have given all they had to see that a Holy Ghost church would be formed. And then we're going to come on along and have a milly mouth and say we're going to be liberal and say that it doesn't matter what you do and how you live. Yes, it matters what you do. Yes, it matters how you live. Amen. The fear of God. If it doesn't matter how we live and what we do anymore, we're casting out. We're, we're doing away with the fear of God. In the, in, in the early church, when they did what they had the right church must fear, there was reverence. And reverence doesn't always mean quietness. It doesn't always, you know, you don't have to be, you can be formal and be very irreverent. You know that? Yes. You can be quiet and be very irreverent. And then on the other hand, you can make noise and still be reverent. Now that's hard to believe in, but you know what the Bible says? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And we're making noise to the Lord. We're praising the Lord. And some people think, and they're not used to it. I understand that. But they, they come in our churches and they think, these people, they are irreverent. Listen how loud they are. I mean, they're shouting. 
They're talking in language I've never heard before. They're dancing about. Who? Why dancing? I thought they danced in the bar room. No, that's the evil dance. You can get a good Holy Ghost dance in the church house. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, and, and, I, and there was a, a, a lady that came into our church one night, one Wednesday evening, and, and, and she didn't know. She said something, the, the gist of what she said was, I just can't believe that these people are making so much noise in church when the Bible says that we should be quiet in church. Well, does it? I didn't quite read it that way, but... See, there's interpretation. You can interpret this thing any way you want to. But we need to interpret it the way the Bible says. Yes, we are to be reverent. And we are to respect the church and to respect the Lord. But we can still praise God with our voice and we can praise Him. Some people are not used to the fact that we all pray together. They're used to when somebody prays, everything around is quiet. And... I went to visit with someone one time and he was not used to, I don't want to say praying in unison because that means everybody's saying the same thing, but you know what I mean. Everybody just prays out loud or prays ever how you want to pray. And he was not used to that. And we went to see this lady and we talked to her, you know, and then we had prayer before we left. When he started praying, I started praying. He said, later he said, man, he said, you, you like to make me have a heart attack. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, when you started praying, when I started praying, so I, I didn't know what in the world to do. I said, well, what you're supposed to do is just keep on praying. But, you know, they're not used to it. They're not used to people praising at the same time. Or they're not used to, but, but we're to reverence the Lord. And not only reverence, why this type of church, church atmosphere? Because it's necessary for reverence and for the supernatural. The supernatural. The Bible says that signs and wonders and wonders and signs were done by the apostles. If we want to see the supernatural power of God, we have to have the right atmosphere or church atmosphere for it. Some people think that Jesus, He healed just because He's Jesus, just because He's God, and He would have healed no matter what. But do you know what? When you read the Gospels and the healing of Christ healings of Christ, you'll discover that in all of those cases, even though it may not specifically say so all the time, that He always had the right, if you want to say it like this, churchmosphere. He always had the right churchmosphere. For instance, there was one case that says, now on a certain day when He was teaching the Word of God, there were doctors and lawyers sitting by, come from Jerusalem and Judea and all uh, the towns around, and they were... The power of the Lord was present to heal them. You remember hearing that from the Bible? Amen. And then the man, the sick of the palsy, was healed. But he had the right atmosphere. He had the right church atmosphere, and the healing atmosphere was there. What is necessary for the healing atmosphere? Well, you've got to have people that love God. You've got to have the Word of God. You see, if we do away with the Word of God, then we can't expect God to do anything. If we're not going to have His Word, and we're not going to honor His Word, we can't expect Him to do anything. How is He going to do it if it's not based on the Word of God? Jesus, yes, He healed. But He based what He did on the Word of God. He taught the Word of God. He preached the Word of God. And the power of God would come into the midst as He was teaching and preaching, and the sick would be healed. And multitudes, great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by Him of their infirmities. came to pass, the sun was setting, they brought unto Him many that were possessed with devils, and He cast out the spirits with His Word. It's the Word of God. You see, we've got to provide the right church atmosphere. And that church atmosphere is not putting a movie on the screen. That church atmosphere is not eating popcorn and belching and getting a pop top off of a soft drink can. That's not the right church atmosphere we're talking about. And these activities may these activities may not be wrong in their place. When you take a Sunday night, you start showing movies on Sunday night, popping popcorn on Sunday night in the main sanctuary because you don't have people that's got enough guts in their belly to stand up and preach the Word of God, then you get in a whole heap of trouble because it's not the right church atmosphere. You can't expect the supernatural power of God to move. You're not going to be moving the 
supernatural power of God showing a G-rated movie up on the screen in the church house on Sunday night. What about unity? Well, they were together. Certainly they were together. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. All that believed were together and had all things common. They were together. They had unity. Endeavoring to keep the unity and the spirit of the bond of peace. So, why do we have to change? Oh, they're not, all change is not wrong, certainly. And we can be contemporary and reach this contemporary society with the message of Jesus Christ. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if it's working, keep on letting it work. Amen. Don't change what the Word of God is. You can't change the Word of God. You can't change the apostolic message. You can't change what the apostles' doctrine. You can't change what Jesus said. Amen. They were generous. They gave. They gave out of what they had. I told the men the other week, the other day, we got together and had lunch, and I told them, I said, your preacher told a lie today. I said, I really did. I told a lie today. This black gal came up, and she got to talking to us, you know, about, oh, I've seen you at different places and whatever, you know. And I said, yeah, I'm uh, a pastor at uh, one of the pastors at Brother Sossman's church in South Henderson Church. You see, one thing that we do, Christians, a lot of times, and I know the Bible says witness and all that, sometimes we shoot our mouth off before putting our brain in gear. Sometimes we just say too much. Nobody asked her who I was and what I was and all that. I should have acted blind and dumb and shouldn't have said anything and whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She got to talk, she kept on talking a little bit. Oh, yeah, well, you're a pastor. You act like she's really interested. And then she said, uh, can I get a couple of dollars out of y'all the next time I saw you? See you? <laughs> Without even thinking what I said, I said, sweetheart, I don't have a dollar. <laughs> Something said, you're telling a lie. You do have a dollar. <laughs> I think I got a ten spot, but I sure didn't want to break it on her. <laughs> Don't be a bum all your life, you know? Hey, I'm handicapped and I can make it. You can too. You don't have to bum money off people. Asking you shall receive, but asking is different from bumming. Thumbing and bumming, both of them are against the law. They sold their possessions and goods. Now, we hadn't gotten there yet. We got away from that. They sold their possessions and good and parted to all men as every man had need. Wow. They were generous. But you know, here it says, and I know that we're to help people anywhere. It doesn't matter if a person needs help, whether they're black or white, red, yellow, Christian, unchristian, whatever it is. When they, when they need help, the need is there. We're to minister to that need as we can. But going by the Scripture here, the church didn't sell what they had and give to the sinners of this world to try to support the welfare system. The church gave within the body of Christ. They gave when the need was there to help each other. Amen. Yes, we're to help the world when that time comes and sometimes but God expects... He doesn't expect us to support the world. The world's got their own support. If things are so good in the kingdom of God, let them come on in then the support will be there for all of us. But the support here, you can read it, and they departed They parted to every man as they had need. And that was within the church. So this, why this type of church must fear? Well, it's necessary. Reverence, supernatural, unity, generosity. And then, what are the results of this type of church must fear? Well, they were together. Their attendance. You got, you're thinking about church attendance? You don't have to worry about church attendance. You, if we get together in the Lord and people get excited in God and the supernatural starts happening, people start beginning to be saved and healed and filled with the Holy Ghost and sanctified and and blessed. You don't have to worry about attendance. Attendance will be there in the church just like it was in the early church. They had fellowship together. They were breaking their bread together from house to house. They did eat their bread together with gladness and singleness of heart. They were happy in what they did. 
Just to have a meal together was such a delight. Just like it is on Wednesday morning here. And we get together and we fellowship together because it's a joy. You shouldn't be uncomfortable around each other. You ought to be uncomfortable around your, the world and the lost people of this world. And if you're more comfortable around them than you are us, either there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong with you. And if you're more uncomfortable around them than you are us, we should be comfortable around each other Amen. because we're part of the body of Christ. We have fellowship together. Yes. There's joy. Joy. We have joy in our hearts and there's joy in the camp. The old song said, a sinner has come home. And we have joy uh, daily. They continued daily with one accord in the temple. They were together and they broke their bread from house to house. They did eat their meat, their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. They had joy in their hearts because God had saved them. Jesus had saved them. God had filled them with the Holy Ghost. They had been sanctified and were living a sanctified life. God was moving in their midst. And how can you help but praise the Lord? Amen. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Now I know that this thing about Jesus turns people off. And I know that, that there's a turn off. But the, the church, even people who don't belong to church, even people who don't live for the Lord, they can't help but see the good things that are happening. And we should be more in favor with people sometimes than we are. Because if they can look and they can see us have problems and they can see us have squabbles, uh, we're going to lose our favor with the people of this world. We're going to lose our favor with society if we, have, if we can't get along with each other and we can't lift one another up, then we're going to lose our favor. Amen. The early church had favor with God and man because... Jesus was Lord. The Holy Ghost was a power of God and able to move. And salvation. Salvation is a result of this proper church atmosphere. Now there are six things here and you can count them. There's attendance, fellowship, joy, praise, favor, salvation. Six is man's number. All the needs of man are met when this proper church atmosphere is set. And the Holy Ghost will set this atmosphere. But we got to let Him set it. Say, well, we want people to be saved. you got to set the right atmosphere for salvation then. We want people to be sanctified. You have to have a church atmosphere where people can come and hear about the Word of God. And God will break the power of sin over their life. And they can be clean. And they can live a clean and holy life. You can't bring the world into the church and expect people to be sanctified. It's not going to happen because you're dragging the dirt into the world into the church and then you expect people to still be sanctified. It's not going to happen. But, and we want people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You've got to have the right atmosphere for that. You've got to have a place where people can come and pray and seek God. You've got to have a place where they can get in the altar, pray and seek the face of the Lord, be filled with the Holy Ghost. You can't be pacifying the community, trying to buddy buddy up on them, and expect people to be filled with the Holy Ghost, coming into the church. That, that's not the right atmosphere. Praise the Lord. You don't have to agree with me. I'm just going by what Acts chapter 2 said in case anybody's wondering. The Lord. Not trying to stretch Acts chapter 2 to fit me. I'm just going by what it said. Amen. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Amen. The Lord saved people. And that's what the real deal is. That's what it's all about. The last line of the Scripture we read. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That is saying to me that if we are careful under the Lord's leading to set the right atmosphere or church atmosphere, the same great and mighty works will take place in our midst. I believe that. Yes. If we have the right church atmosphere, God will do the same things now that He has always done. Amen. He will not fail. The sick will be healed. People will be saved. People will be sanctified. will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And a lot of times... We, maybe we are saved. Maybe we are sanctified and spirit-filled. But we still have burdens. God can lift that burden today. He can take that burden off your shoulders. You have needs in your life. They might not fall under the three works of grace or whatever it is, but you have a need in your life. Sometimes I have a need in my life. I don't know what it falls under. It's just you, God knows about it. But He's able to meet our need. He's able to give us 
the proper church atmosphere. And we have it here. Thank God for it. And I know many churches do. Thank God for that. But there are places where you go. I'm telling you, I would, wouldn't dare call the name of it, but I, I preached at a church several years ago. And one of their announcements was, we want everybody to bring their favorite CD Saturday night. We're going to get together and have a dance and have a good time. Now you tell me, brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to judge anybody, but God Almighty help us. God Almighty help us. And this same group is the one that we had our history from to start with. And if we're not careful, we won't be five years behind them. If we're not careful, we'll let the same liberalism creep into our individual lives and into our church atmosphere. And we won't have the Holy Ghost church atmosphere anymore. We'll have a liberal atmosphere. Once you bite on that liberal apple, it's hard to get rid of it, brother. Once you go down that road of easy believism and cheap liberalism, we talk about liberalism in politics, liberalism does a whole lot worse in the church than it ever did in politics. The Holy Ghost in the first early church, there was no place for liberalism. And there's no place for the Holy Ghost in in the right kind of religion the right kind of church atmosphere, there's no place for it now. Because it will lead you down a loose way of living. It will lead you away from God. You won't be able to preach on certain things anymore. I can't preach on drinking because she drinks. I can't preach on homo because there might be one sitting over there. I can't preach on whatever. Well, you don't preach on whatever. You preach the Word of God and let the chips fall where they may. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 